Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, new tools in the final push to get Canadians vaccinated against COVID. People who made the efforts to be vaccinated, that they are able to come back to a normal life. What Quebecers will need it for, and will it work for those holdouts? Yes, I might have my arm twisted and be forced into getting a vaccination. Ottawa considers a sweeping vaccine mandate for all federally regulated industries. Those who are hesitant, it's time to get your vaccine. They fled Afghanistan fearing for their lives. Why some Afghan interpreters who worked with Canadian forces are now going back into the danger zone. Right now they're desperate to try and find a way to safety and try to find a way to Canada. I'm Adrian Arsenault in Tokyo. It's been a long road to the top of the Olympic podium for Canadian decathlete Damian Warner. But now he is wearing the mantle of the world's greatest athlete. Canada has the Olympic champion in decathlon. How he took an improvised training regimen and a profound trust in his career-long coach and turned it all to gold. This is The National. We begin with a growing concern and growing debate over how to convince those of you who are not vaccinated to get your COVID shot, even as Canada crosses one major milestone and closes in on another. As of tonight, more than 60% of the total population has had both doses. Of those eligible for vaccines, so that's people 12 and older, it's almost 70% among the highest rates in the world. But as health officials warn, the pace is slowing just as concerns about a fourth wave are picking up. So tonight we examine the cases for and against requiring vaccinations. But we begin with news from Quebec, now the first province to announce a vaccine passport system. Here's Sarah Levin. Probably, I don't know, yes, maybe, I don't know. Montrealer Robin Boole hasn't gotten the COVID-19 vaccine yet. She's breastfeeding and wasn't fully comfortable getting it, but she may now. If now I won't even be able to go out and go to concerts, yes, I might have my arm twisted and be forced into getting a vaccination. It's people just like Boole, the vaccine-hesitant Quebec's premier says he's trying to convince with a vaccine passport. We'll put in place the uh, passport in order that people who made the efforts to be vaccinated, that they uh, are able to come back to a normal life. Last week, Quebec was averaging around 130 new COVID cases per day. Today, though, it reported 305. Hospitalizations and deaths are also expected to rise with the onset of a fourth wave. The details of the passport have yet to be released, but it'll be required for non-essential services. That could include restaurants, movie theaters and concerts. Welcome news for some business owners. It's better, way better uh, to us to have the passport vaccine than to be shut down completely. Few other provinces have taken this step. Manitoba has issued cards to those fully vaccinated, allowing them to go to sporting events like tonight's home opener for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers or outdoor concerts. But some provinces like Ontario and Alberta have ruled out the idea of passports. Doctors seem to agree that the Delta variant requires a more aggressive push for vaccinations. It's no longer a disease of the elderly. It's a disease of the unvaccinated. Bull's friend, also unvaccinated, isn't convinced. The vaccine doesn't seem like a, a, a fix, a cure-all. And um, I just don't think I'm totally ready to make the jump yet. Bull, on the other hand? I might get vaccinated. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I want to go see the flaming lips. So. <laughs> Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Quebec is also considering making vaccinations mandatory for health workers, while the federal government is thinking about going even wider by mandating vaccines for all government workers, even thousands of workers in certain private industries. Rafi Bujikanian looks at who could be affected and how they're reacting. It is time for people to get vaccinated. For federal employees, even employees of federally regulated industries, that could become an order. I have asked the clerk of the Privy Council, who is responsible for the federal public service, to look at mandatory vaccinations. For In total, such a policy would cover hundreds of thousands of workers, from tax collectors to soldiers and police, to those who work in banks, airlines, railways and communications. People are dying and will die who don't have to die. 
This comes a week after the U.S. imposed a similar measure of its own on its civil service, while private companies from Facebook to Disney and Walmart have already mandated vaccines. The idea is obviously to get as many people as vaccinated and for the respective federal governments to put their money where their mouths are. But public health officials here warn federal departments and the Treasury Board have much to consider. I think uh, everything is being uh, reviewed and examined right now. Employment experts warn there could be confusion, even pushback. Then that is going to uh, create uh, what I would say is a patchwork system because you have the provinces who are not indicating, in some cases explicitly indicating, that they're not going to be doing this. And you have the federal government saying that they are intending to do this. There are many people involved in discussions on all this. One public sector union, the Christian Labour Union of Canada, that represents transportation workers, says it's opposed to mandatory vaccinations due to workers' moral objections. The Public Service Alliance of Canada says it is watching closely and expects government to consult them. Meanwhile, employers such as banks, Air Canada, WestJet and Via Rail say they've been strongly encouraging their staff to get vaccinated. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bulgosh, a member of Ontario's Vaccine Distribution Task Force and an infectious diseases specialist in Toronto. So, Dr. Bulgosh, we've seen two approaches to try to increase the number of people getting vaccinated. Let's start with Quebec's. Uh, do you think that's uh, the right way to go? It'll certainly promote vaccination, and many people who are on the fence will ultimately get vaccinated because of that. For example, in France, when they mentioned this, the next day, a million people signed up for vaccination. You can't lockdown anymore. No one's going to accept lockdowns. You can't overwhelm your health care system. And if cases are rising and, and hospitalizations are going up and you need to do something to keep the economy going and keep people uh, to be to enable people to do what they want to do, then this is a system that we have to be open minded to. And, and what about employers requiring their workers to get vaccinated? Yeah, it's interesting because we're seeing more and more of that as well. In fact, many large organizations in the United States have done that. We're seeing large airlines. We're seeing Microsoft, Google, Facebook do this. We're seeing many campuses do this. We're also seeing large healthcare systems do this as well. Kaiser Permanente employs a quarter of a million people and they're mandating vaccinations in them. So this is not new. And I think we're going to see more and more of this happen. You've got to create a safe work environment for your employees. And this is one way of doing it. 15 seconds left. It's going to be contentious. Absolutely, it will. It's that tug of war between individual rights and freedoms, and and creating you know public health and public safety. All right, Dr. Bogosh, thank you. My pleasure. And British Columbia's provincial health officer says vaccines are the best way to combat the surge in cases in this province. Ninety-five percent across the province of people who are infected right now are unimmunized, or people who have not yet had their second dose. Dr. Bonnie Henry also said most of the new infections are among those 20 to 40 years old and that vaccines remain the most effective way to control the spread and protect people from severe outcomes. Canada's chief public health officer says no decision has been made yet about recommending COVID booster shots for Canadians, but the issue is being looked at closely. So whether they're immunocompromised, that's one of the top groups that are going to be examined uh, in terms of the need for a booster. Some of the earliest vaccinees in long-term care, that's some of the next groups. Dr. Tam's comments come a day after a plea from the World Health Organization for countries to hold off on boosters until more people are vaccinated around the world. Despite that, both Germany and France said they will move ahead with third doses starting in September for some vulnerable groups. In the United States, low vaccination rates is driving a huge surge in cases. And as Chris Reyes explains, officials are making a desperate plea to reach those who have been hesitant until now. This South Florida hospital's COVID cases have surged so much they have patients in the cafeteria and a conference room. Florida is one of seven states with some of the lowest vaccination rates in the U.S., accounting for half of the country's new cases and hospitalizations in the last week. In another full-court press, public health officials begged Americans to trust the COVID vaccine. When people say, I'm concerned that this went too fast, 
it did not go too fast. It was a major investment, both in the logistics, the resources, and the clinical and basic research. This week, the U.S. hit its goal of getting 70% of its population vaccinated with one dose, but four weeks late. The CDC reports that almost the entire country still has high or substantial transmission of the virus. You haven't gotten vaccinated. I have not. Joy Bland lives in one of those hotspots in Southern California. She's exactly the kind of person public health officials have been trying to reach for months. I know I, I can't be doing my part, which is why I've had a change of heart on getting the vaccine. President Joe Biden has been pleading all week for that kind of change of heart. The vaccine saves lives and it could save yours or your child's. Some private companies are jumping in to help, like the Miami Heat. Today, the basketball team held a vaccination event offering tickets for shots. Now they're incentivized to come out and they sense the urgency and they're getting vaccinated. Bland said her anxiety kept her from getting the shot. Understand that it's not that we're trying to be selfish. It's legit out of fear. We're scared. Even with new vaccinations on the rise this week, the enormous challenge for public health officials remains to reach more people like Bland before the Delta variant can spread even faster. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. The federal government says it's offered a path to protection for Afghan workers who helped Canadian forces during the war. As many of those workers are being resettled in Canada, others say they are being left out. Ashley Burke shows us why some of them are being forced to take incredible risks to get here. I want to see when you want to. This is the growing chaos in Afghanistan, the Taliban gaining ground, hunting Afghan interpreters working with foreign forces. This one asked CBC News to conceal his identity over fears for his safety. Because I'm really scared. Out of desperation, he says in January, he fled to Turkey. Now he's done the unthinkable return to Afghanistan, all for a shot at a Canadian lifeline. The Prime Minister said this process will be collected really fast. They forced me, you know, indirectly. If you want to go to Canada, you have to be in Afghanistan. Canada currently only accepts applications from inside Afghanistan. There's many Afghans that have been displaced to other countries, um, and right now they're desperate to try and find a way to safety and try to find a way to Canada, and we shouldn't be putting them in that predicament. Our Advocate groups say other Afghans excluded from Canada's resettlement plan are also considering returning home to get their families out too, who they say are being targeted by the Taliban. They rather risk death. They've risked it once. They've they rather risk it again and go back to Afghanistan for hope. They are basically all living on a prayer. Today, the government wouldn't commit to changing the rules. Instead, it said other programs are available for those outside Afghanistan. We continue to work uh, with uh, uh, Afghan interpreters and support staff around uh, Afghanistan to bring in, uh, bring home as many of them as possible. This interpreter hopes that soon. He's now in hiding, hoping Canada approves him before the Taliban finds him first. Every cell of my body saying to me that if Talib catch, uh, catches you, you will be killed. He says he started working for the Canadian Armed Forces right out of high school. At 18, he says he thought it was a chance for a better life. But a decade later, he now worries it's a death sentence. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Damien Warner has won gold in the decathlon, his score, an Olympic record. And so, by one measure, that makes Warner the greatest decathlete in the history of the Games. But even that may not do his achievement justice. And so for that, let's go to Tokyo. Adrian? Hey there, Ian. You're right. This is an event that takes place over two days. You're talking long jump, high jump, pole vault, pole vault discus, javelin, shot put, hurdles, 100 meter, 400 meter, 1500 meter. It is hard enough to say. Can you imagine trying to do it? And especially in this heat. The Tokyo track is beyond punishing. Heat in the 40s, cruel even for short races. So the decathletes running. And they're away. Jumping, throwing, competing in 10 events, knew they were in for a test. There is a reason the person awarded gold in Olympic decathlon is labeled the world's greatest athlete. 
Warner coming to the finish line, dipping. Until Tokyo, a Canadian never held that title. Damian Warner always coveted it. It's his third Olympics. He's the oldest competitor here, and almost right away, the strongest. Consider just one event, the long jump. His distance so good, had he been competing in the individual event, he would have won bronze. Former Canadian decathlete Michael Smith, now a commentator, sensed momentum. This is the, the Masters, this is Mike Weir, this is, this is the Stanley Cup, this is it. Consider how he got here. When the pandemic hit and tracks were closed, Warner's coaches transformed an unused hockey arena in London, Ontario. It was cold and small, slowing down after a sprint almost ridiculous. But the space was built by those he trusted, the men who once coached him in high school basketball and stayed with him. Good. Garlation's dream was to get to Tokyo too. Perfect position. He did, trackside and having so much fun. I told Damien way, way back, like we're talking 2009, that I thought, that he would stand at the top of the podium, be the best in the world one day. And I told him, that's the only reason I'm doing this, because I'm not a huge fan of track and field. <laughs> he says the best thing to happen to a coach on the biggest day of an athlete's career is to find yourself simply a cheerleader. He was. In the last minute of the 1500 meters, it was so clear the work had worked. Damian Warner didn't just win, he set an Olympic record. He has broken 9,000 points and created history for Canada. Without crowds in the stands, it's easy to spot the friendly faces. Leishon so ready for the moment. Canada has the Olympic champion in decathlon for the first time in Olympic history. I remember when I was first starting the decathlon, Gar and I got in our probably one and only argument. And I was like, I'm done. I don't want to do this. It's, I'm not having fun. And he told me like, just keep working at this. You're going to be a world champion one day. And uh, that day came true today. It's an amazing thing. It, it's hard for me to understand um, how so many people have come together to support one single person. Nothing I could ever say or do could pay them back. But I hope this is one of those things that shows them that all their hard work didn't go to waste. And I'm going to do whatever I can uh, to pay that forward. The right headspace, the right training, the right team. Sometimes a plan really does come together. So you heard Damien there talk about wanting to pay it forward. He was very quick to say that he has his eye on Pierce Lepage. He is also a Canadian, also in the decathlon, also hovered near the podium for most of the event. And Damien said that he just wants to make sure that, that he can lift Pierce the way he was lifted. Ian? Such an incredible uh, couple of accomplishments in the decathlon. Here we are, Adrian, believe it or not, halfway through the second week <laughs> of the Games. And I'm curious about your reflections on how Canada has been doing. Uh, it's so interesting. You know, when we started here, on the podium said, you know, we're not going to make predictions. The pandemic, it was too crazy. It's too hard to gauge training and competitors. So... We won't say anything. Other, other data groups did. Grace Notes, for example, said, I think Canada's going to do exactly on hovering what it did in Rio, 21-ish medals. It is right on track so far. And as predicted, the first week, the women dominate in the water. The second week, the Canadian men dominate on the track. And so far, so good. Everything according to script. Uh, still waiting for a few more surprises. Ian? All right. Adrian, surprises are always good. Thank you. Okay. Well, speaking of medals, Canadian Evan Dunphy capturing bronze in the punishing 50-kilometer race walk. Canada's Evan Dunphy has won bronze in Tokyo 2020. He finished with a scream of triumph. It was about 30 degrees Celsius, 70% humidity, so in a way less a race here than a brutal test of the limits of human endurance. Some racers dropped out, some vomited with exhaustion. Dunphy persevered and made a surprise late race push to capture his spot on the podium. Well, back in Canada, sixth province has joined the federal government's subsidized childcare plan. For families here in Quebec and across the country, we've got your back as we rebuild from this pandemic. 
Ottawa says it will be investing $6 billion in Quebec's affordable child care system over the next five years. The Premier, Francois Legault, vows to put that federal money towards creating at least 37,000 new child care spaces. A nursing home in Regina was not prepared for a COVID outbreak that took the lives of 39 residents. That's the finding of Saskatchewan's ombudsman who investigated the extended care Parkside facility. Omera Issa has more on what was uncovered. Brian Albert still remembers the agony he felt when his 98-year-old mother contracted COVID-19 at Extended Care Parkside. She tested positive. Um, her respiration was not very good. Her fever was high. There was just a whole bunch of symptoms. She survived, but many didn't. Today, Saskatchewan's Ombudsman Mary McFadgen released a damning report into the province's deadliest COVID-19 nursing home outbreak. The outbreak here was eight months into the pandemic, but still McFadgen said the home was woefully unprepared. Parkside had 198 residents at the time. Of the 198 residents, 194 tested positive for the virus, 39 died. 132 staff members were also infected. The ombudsman found workers cared for residents while showing symptoms. These residents were supposed to be properly cared for, treated with respect and dignity, and kept safe. In our view, they were not. Extended Care Incorporated has now apologized to the families of those who died. In a statement to CBC, it said, We are deeply sorry for what happened during the COVID-19 outbreak at Parkside and the many challenges it brought. The report also revealed Extended Care wanted to do rapid testing for its employees on site, but the government didn't feel it was necessary. The province has appointed an administrator to oversee all extended care homes in the province for a period of 30 days. Today's report is very troubling and we need to do better. The findings and recommendations in this report provide a clear path to do better. The report also criticizes the Saskatchewan Health Authority for failing to make sure that the private company was complying with provincial orders. Amara Issa, CBC News, Saskatoon. An out-of-control wildfire in B.C.'s interior has prompted new evacuation orders. Up next, how rising temperatures and winds are threatening to create even more damage in the region. Plus, counting down to a historic final. When I was younger, I didn't have very many, like, female coaches, and I didn't think that, like, girls' teams could go far. What the Canadian women's Olympic soccer run means for the next generation of players. And later, honoring a local healthcare hero. It's just simply such a surreal experience and definitely one of the most amazing experiences of my life. The real life inspiration behind a one of a kind Barbie. We're back in two. Welcome back. We're watching a late developing story here in British Columbia where crews are desperately battling a wildfire in the interior northwest of Kelowna. It's spread over more than 300 square kilometers. Katie Nicholson is on the story for us tonight. As winds whipped up near one of the province's largest fires, flames and sparks crossed the highway near Westwold. It's all gone. Further east in Monty Lake, this wall of flames moved in. Firefighter Steph Gamash fears her home, her entire town, is gone. My place was on fire when I left, um, including every other house along the stretch. It's, it's, it's completely gone. It's, uh, yeah, it's tearing off up the Paxton on the other side of the highway now. Those moments near Monty Lake captured by a woman evacuating cattle from the fire zone. Just uh, lots, lots of dark, dark orange smoke, and we can see the flames at the top of the trees. And you can feel the heat coming right off the hill. Kelly Kennedy says the fire moved in on several properties. I don't know how many houses, three or four houses, had, had small properties there. So um, I'm not sure. I did hear that it had hit one of the residents' yard. That was the last we heard. Um, it is headed towards Kamloops. Late last night, this town, one of several, evacuated, forcing hundreds living between Kamloops and Vernon out. Today, for hours, nothing but smoke moving through town streets. As the wind came, a worst-case scenario, 
with gusts of 40 kilometers an hour, prompting a highway closure. The White Rock Lake wildfire um, recently did cross Highway 97, um, kind of north of where the fire perimeter had previously been reported. Um, so we have been experiencing sustained um, 25 kilometer an hour winds from the southwest, which pushed it across the highway there. Provincial officials unable to confirm any structures lost. The White Rock Lake fire just one of the more than 30 wildfires of note, like this one near Lillooet. With rain and lightning in the forecast, the next 48 hours crucial. The White Rock Fire now BC's number one firefighting priority. And Katie joins us now from our newsroom here in Vancouver. Not a lot of information at this point from officials, lots of rumors on social media, but you've been talking to evacuees tonight. Yeah, you know, this is a small community, but it is tight-knit. They are keeping in touch with one another. Uh, and there are people who pulled away from town as their homes were on fire. So that's where a lot of this information is coming from. You saw in our piece there a, a, a car driving along a road while a, while, a, a wall of flames was sort of encroaching on the town. That was taken by one of the evacuees tonight who told us she believes that she lost her home. Now, official didn't, it's going to take a couple of hours before they're able to weigh in. Provincial officials would need to actually survey the area. It's getting dark. Planes are going to be landing, so we won't get a full picture as to what the, what the damage story is, at least until the morning. Ian? It is so reminiscent in terms of lack of information of what we saw, uh, it, it, you know, what, four or five weeks ago with some of the fires in the interior. Let's hope the outcome this time is better. Katie, thank you very much. You're welcome. When we come back, a residential school survivors fight for justice. There's a burden in my life that uh, something is missing. What he alleges happened decades ago and why police are just speaking with him now. And later, the Prime Minister promised action against anti-black racism, but more than a year later, did his government deliver? It has been a long fight for justice for the survivors of Canadian residential schools, and it's especially challenging for individuals bringing forth sexual abuse allegations. Jorge Barrera shares the story of an Ontario man interviewed this week by police. There's a burden in my life that uh, something is missing. Simeon Solomon carries a deep wound from childhood. I cannot move forward because of this uh, uh, the sexual assault. He recently came to Ottawa with hope to begin healing. I need to recover. Solomon wants justice. For an aggravated sexual assault he says happened, when he was a 12-year-old student at St. Anne's Residential School. Today we're going to be going to meet with the Justice of the Peace and we will be laying an information on a private prosecution basis. For years, Solomon has fought to get his day in court. Right now, I'm kind of trembling. You know, my heart is pumping. In the late 1990s, he told OPP investigators about another incident that led to a charge of indecent assault against a former St. Anne staff member named Claude Chenier, one of seven charged by the OPP in 1997, following a years-long investigation. But on the day he was to appear in court as a witness, Solomon missed the flight from his Fort Albany First Nation home. I overslept. I worked till five, then I had to work overtime. The charge against Chenier was dropped, at the time, Solomon didn't tell OPP investigators about another alleged incident, an aggravated sexual assault. CBC News is not naming the alleged perpetrator because he has not been charged. I want justice. He wants this incident investigated. That's why he traveled to the Ottawa courthouse. But less than an hour later... Today is a saddened day for me. The Justice of the Peace would not accept the case. She informed us that because of COVID-19, the body governing them has determined that laying on private prosecutions cannot occur. I feel like giving up. Beginning to take about suicidal thoughts. You know. After Solomon returned home, CBC News reached out to the Ontario Provincial Police about his case. The OPP said it would review his file. 
On Tuesday, three officers landed in Fort Albany to interview Solomon. After a three-hour meeting, Solomon told CBC News it could take several weeks for the OPP to decide what to do next. Solomon says it's left him again, waiting for justice. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Ottawa. And CBC News has an Indigenous-led team investigating the impacts and harms caused by residential schools. If you have information, tips, or something you want to share, email us, where are they at cbc.ca. Up next, Canada's gold medal soccer hopes. I think that it's really empowering for women to see these other women doing so well. As the Canadian women prepare to go for gold, what it means for young players here at home. And later, a bridge to the past, how one city in the United States is working to undo past wrongs. Okay, if you missed that, here's a second look at textbook tuck. China's Chuen Hong Chan piercing the water, barely a splash. This is what a perfect dive looks like. And then she did it again. Tens from all seven judges. All in all, her score just shy of an Olympic record and certainly enough to take gold in the 10-meter platform event. Chuen is just 14 years old. The Canadian women's soccer team will leave Tokyo with at least a silver. And after their upcoming battle with Sweden, it could be gold. Canada's status as a women's soccer superpower, more certain than ever. And Chris O'Neill Yates shows us what that means for the would-be stars of the future. Even bad weather can't keep Carol Leonard and her under-15 soccer team from practice. It's just like a super fun game, and like you can be with your friends and like your teammates, and it's a super fast, fun game. I just love it so much. Today, there is only one team color. Anna Godin says she'll be watching one player in particular. Um, Christine Sinclair, she's just a huge inspiration to me and I think she's great. Seeing Canada's Olympic soccer team get this far is a big deal for these young soccer players. I think that it's really empowering for women to see these other women doing so well and going so far within the Olympics right now. When I ha was younger, I didn't have very many like female coaches and I didn't think that like girls teams could go far. At St. Mary's University, the Huskies women's soccer team is gearing up for their season opening. They're happy about the attention their sport is getting right now. Women's soccer in Canada is sometimes forgotten about, but I think this is going to bring a lot more media attention to it, and it's going to inspire a lot of young girls, especially, to pursue the sport. Even though Canada has performed well so far, these players know that winning Olympic gold will not be easy. I think it's going to be a very tough game against Sweden. I think our young players have really stepped up, and I was thinking it was really exciting beating the U.S. for the first time in 20 years. So. No matter what the outcome, Lalaikas hopes that Canada's success leads to better funding for women's soccer provide the support for girls to kind of have that dream and have people behind them knowing that they can reach that goal. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Halifax. So when is the women's soccer final? Well, with Tokyo half a world away and many hours ahead, it's easy to miss Canada's top Olympic moments. Luckily, Andrew is keeping track of what's coming. So we've had some pretty big days and big nights, these Olympic Games, but the next 12 hours are very likely going to drive a lot of tomorrow's news. So yes, there's the women's soccer game, Canada versus Sweden rescheduled due to hot weather for 8 a.m. Eastern tomorrow, that's 5 a.m. Pacific. And a little contextual note here, it's not a grudge match like it was in the semis against the United States, but it almost is because in the last FIFA Women's World Cup two years ago, it was Sweden versus Canada in the knockout stage and Sweden won. Canada was sent packing very early. But beyond soccer, two big events uh, involving Canada on the track, the men's four by 100 meter relay, they blazed their way into the final and they will run tomorrow morning at 9.50 a.m. Eastern time. Andre de Grasse with the anchor leg, and the Americans, normally so dominant in this relay, they didn't even advance to the final. They made huge mistakes in their opening heat. So this race is a little more open than usual. Finally, the men's 5,000 meter final. Two Canadians to watch, Justin Knight and Mo Ahmed. Now this is arguably Ahmed's best event. He came fourth in Rio at the last Olympics, running 5K in just over 13 minutes. But 
In Tokyo, watch how much gas he has left in the tank. It will be his third run. He ran the 10K about a week ago. He ran the 5K heats to qualify for this final and a shot at the medal. So by the end, he could be in a lot of pain. But here's a little nugget for you. His coach actually shouts at him, feel the pain. And that's his cue to kick it into overdrive. So we will see how many gears he has left by the time we all wake up tomorrow morning. Up next, we check in on the federal government's commitments to fight anti-black racism, from symbolic gestures to concrete action. Why some say the government has fallen short. It's been more than a year since Justin Trudeau took a knee as a gesture of his commitment to fight anti-black racism. Now CBC News has analyzed what concrete steps his government has taken since then. David Thurton looks at where progress has been made and where critics say the government is still falling far short. There's counseling happening, there's um, life skills happening. To help black Canadians navigate a justice system which at times seems stacked against them, Julian Campbell and his team are there. Study after study has found that black and indigenous people consistently are overrepresented in the justice system. Last year, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau joined protesters demanding reforms to that system. It's great that he sides with um, Black Lives Matter in, in terms of taking the knee and all of that stuff, but at the end of the day, we want to see results. CBC News analyzed those results of the 44 directives put forward by the Parliamentary Black Caucus last year we found that the government is taking action on 24. For example, millions in loans for black businesses, although some have raised issues with the application process. And there's also the help the government is offering black community organizations. $96 million announced yesterday. Our government has made tremendous progress, but I am the first to acknowledge that there is more work to be done. And there's some work to be done in black arts and culture. Our analysis shows that there's no new money there. As for criminal justice reforms, the bill that the Liberals brought forward, justice advocates say, doesn't go far enough. Many mandatory minimum sentences would still remain on the books. Until we get those changes, I'm not sure what we're doing. We may just be, um, you know, spinning our wheels. And what progress has been made for black communities could be in jeopardy if that bill dies after a widely expected election call. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. The Black Lives Matter movement may have started in the United States, but many parts of the country still haven't reckoned with their past. Tonight, we want to revisit a story that first aired earlier this summer about a distressing day in Tennessee. As Paul Hunter shows us, it's part of history that some in Chattanooga are making sure no one ever forgets. Spanning the divide in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Walnut Street Bridge is postcard perfect. A place to stroll in the sunshine and enjoy the warm southern breeze. It is also a place of a savage, near unspeakable atrocity. Sometimes you can sort of feel the eerie ghost of the past when you know the story. Eric Atkins took us to the place where 115 years ago on this spot, a black man named Ed Johnson, who'd been wrongly convicted of rape in a sham trial, was pulled from a prison cell, marched down to that bridge, and then lynched. And this is where we believe they would have brought Ed Johnson when he was taken out of the county jail. Some are here. Some were in here. And they shot at him. Oh, oh yeah, they shot at him mercilessly. Even when he was on the ground, he was shot several dozen times. They wanted to make sure that uh, the job they set out to do was finished. The Chattanooga Times headlined his last words, God bless you all, he said. I'm innocent. Shot even as he was hanged, a bullet broke the rope. He fell to the ground still breathing. As the Times put it, he was then shot to death by a mob like a dog. There was outrage at the time, and though it took decades, Johnson's conviction was later overturned. But as with so many of America's more than 4,000 documented lynchings, for many, 
his murder kind of faded from memory. Now, his story is being retold. This is where, this is where the statues will be? This is where they will be, three of them. This summer, in the very shadow of the bridge where he was killed, this almost finished memorial to Johnson and his two black lawyers will be open for all to come learn the story and consider America's lingering racial divide. Atkins is one of the volunteers behind the project. Hopefully with this memorial, people can have a changed heart. We can have a changed heart to treat people the way that you want to be treated. We can have an open heart to where we all are free and we all have rights and we all can advance the way that the country is supposed to advance. Indeed, lost on no one is that stories like Johnson's, black Americans killed unjustly, continue in this country, as does rage, with reason to still use that word in desperate pleading protest. Working with Atkins at that bridge yeah, is Donovan Brown. We could have simply forgotten Ed Johnson and went on our, our way, but in a society where we do honor, where we do memorial. He underlines more than a century after Johnson's death, his story is instructive and vital. Ed Johnson is still communicating to us, and we are doing our best to listen to him in the time where there's a reckoning happening both within the city of Chattanooga, within our county, and certainly within the country. He lives. <laughs> he does. And here's something else about that bridge. To this day in Chattanooga, there remain black Americans who stay away from it, who never forgot. And they still see other reminders, lessons are needed. It started from this era. Greg Beck, who indeed will not step foot on that bridge, brought us here to one of those Confederate statues you hear about, still in place in the U.S. South. This one's in Chattanooga, not far from where Johnson was hanged and shot. Is it trying to say the South will return? Or what is it trying to say? It continues to say to us, you are marginal. Beck sees the Johnson Memorial as a step forward, but only a step. Alongside that bridge, it urges the value of learning from America's past. I want people to understand when they walk by there that there is a power somewhere that that's trying to do some things as, a, as a, far as justice is concerned. This was something that that poor man went through that nobody else should have to go through. As the memorial nears completion, a once neglected cemetery on the other side of Chattanooga is also in the midst of renewal. Look carefully and you'll find a name that now resonates again in this city. Ed Johnson, not forgotten. One voice in America's continuing reckoning on race, undenied. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Paul is such a thoughtful storyteller. Coming up, a Toronto doctor is on the list of role models that have inspired a new line of Barbies. Being able to have a Barbie such as this that young girls can look up to. She's one of six women being recognized by the toy company, and she's our moment next. Dr. Chika Stacy Oriua remembers dressing up her Barbies as doctors. Now she's living out her childhood dream and has a Barbie made in her likeness to show for it. The Canadian physician and advocate hopes a doll celebrating success as a black female doctor will inspire kids to push the limits of their play and potential. Tonight, she and her mini-me doll is our moment. I am so excited. I'm so honored to have had this opportunity to collaborate with Barbie for the role model program. There's a lot of nostalgia and a lot of gratitude for the journey because when I was a lot younger, I had a house full of Barbies and imagined that they would be doctors and poets and performers. And so to know that I've now grown to become the dreams that, you know, I once had for my Barbie and then to now actually have a Barbie that represents me and my values and, and also, you know, black women in medicine. So it was really important to me for the Barbie to have Afro textured hair, skin tone as well. And then also ensuring that the Barbie looked like a doctor because I do want to 
redefine the narrative of what a doctor looks like. This really represents power of representation, of being able to identify with a dream and see yourself in it. And it's just simply such a surreal experience and definitely one of the most amazing experiences of my life. So she's really pleased and she is clearly a fantastic choice. If you don't know her resume, read up on her because uh, she is a very impressive person. Uh, but I was surprised to hear only one of those dolls was made. Imagine if the toy company made a bunch of them, sold them at stores and we could see kids buying them. Now that would be a moment. That is The National for August 5th. Good night.